Welcome to the folks who have joined. Um, most it looks like everybody is connected to audio. Just in case there are those who can't hear, I'm putting a message in the chat box. We'll be starting in about two minutes. Looks like we're gaining in numbers, which is good. You hate to throw a party and nobody comes. Okay, so I have the top of the hour, um, so I'm going to get started. Um, my name is Rebecca Brown, and I work for the NNNLM Training Office. And I am hosting today's session. Um, I just wanted to let folks who are on the call right now, and I'm trying to see if people are still getting connected to audio. Um, some of you may have attended some of the previous sessions and know that we had been working on getting CE credit. That was finally approved. So I will have a link for you to the evaluation for today's session. And I'll put that in the chat box when the session is over. And just as an announcement, if you attended any of the other sessions, I will be sending out separate emails with separate evaluation links for each of those sessions. So keep your eyes um, open for that. Um, and we are recording today's session. And we do have um, captions. I'm going to put the captioning link into the chat box one more time. And then I am going to turn it over to Becky Ramasco Kelly. Take it away, Becky. Uh, I just wanted to say before we get started, too, that there's been some updates to the continuing education credit. Um, Rebecca, would you be able to explain that a little bit? So was I, was I just muted? I gave a long talk. Was I oh, muted? No. Yeah. <laughs> no, maybe you did cover it, and I, I just missed it for some reason. Okay. No, no well, <laughs> let me know in the chat box. I could have been muted by mistake. So... If somebody, did anybody hear Rebecca Brown talk about, okay, great, okay. Great. Okay, oh, great, perfect. I don't know how I missed that one. This is clearly a Friday, so we'll go ahead and get started. <laughs> um, welcome, everyone. Um, you are here today to learn about the rural health pathway as part of the um, Pathways Project. My name is Becky Ramosco kelly I'm part of a three-person team. Um, from Informed International. We are a team of external consultants that were hired to uh, complete this Pathways project. This is a brief overview of what we'll be doing today. First, we'll talk about the project, then we'll go through an evaluation background, talking about what evaluation is, a um, metaphor I have for evaluation, and an orientation to the five steps to evaluation and why or how we encourage using these steps. Then we'll talk about the rural health pathway specifically and walk through step by step the different resources that are on the website. We'll then end with a demonstration of the rural health pathway in real time and then leave about 10 minutes for questions and uh, answer sessions. So, Today, I hope that you are able to walk away with an understanding of the Pathways Project and understand how to use the Rural Health Pathway 
as well as learn evaluation considerations for rural health programs. So what is the Evaluation Pathways Project? The Evaluation Pathways Project was initiated to enable grant recipients to pursue a particular interest and to develop evaluation plans and evaluation skills specifically tailored to their projects. Four populations were identified, each of which had a pathway developed for it, which you can see here on this slide. K-12 health, LGBTQIA plus health, race and ethnicity, and rural health. You might be wondering, why did we develop these topic-specific pathways? When we were developing the pathways, we had a goal of highlighting resources, methods, and approaches that enable one to effectively and sensitively carry out evaluations of common programs funded by NNLM grants. So based on this, NNLM selected pathways for these four populations. Each pathway covers evaluation that is responsive to the needs of programs in that topic area. Right now, we're in the training and marketing phase of our project. We first started with document review and planning, then moved into pathway design and website integration. Although this was an iterative process, so we completed these um, as we had more reviews. And our pathways have been reviewed by EWG members, CHAT, HSL members at EDEB, reviewers in the PSR region, and other volunteers. Some of you might, in fact, be on this webinar today. And we really appreciate all the effort that you've put into reviewing everything. Um, and we look forward to showing you how the pathways have developed up until this point. After we finish these webinars, which today is the last of a five uh, webinar series, we'll complete finalization and handover in March of 2021. Previous webinars can be found on the website you are uh, listed here, but it's under the classes page on the NNLM website. There's recordings and PDF copies of all the slides, so if you have any questions about any of the previous topics, feel free to visit this pathway at any the, or this web page at any time. I won't be spending too much time on the topics covered in the previous webinars. So I recommend uh, that you view the previous lessons if you have any questions. Uh, Becky, I hate to interrupt. Um, it was brought to my attention that you sound a little, sound a little muffled. I don't know if you moved. A little muffled. So I, I don't know if you can get closer it. to your mic or. Let me see. I can try changing my mic and see if that helps. Thank you. And that's always a little tricky on the fly. But we'll see. How about that? Is oh, it better? so much better. Okay, my great. Opinion. <laughs> Good, perfect. <laughs> I changed the microphone. That okay. is, so I hopefully this will work better now. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, just as a brief recap of the slides, um, so we've been working. Oh, good. I'm so glad it's much better. Thank you all. <laughs> um, as a brief recap of what I previously said, since it was hard to um, hear, we worked through these different web steps to create our um, pathways for four different subtopics for uh, rural health, race and ethnicity, LGBTQIA plus health, and K-12 health. Um, we, this is the last of five webinars in this series, and we'll complete finalization and handover in March of 2021. There's a URL listed on this slide here, or you can go to the classes section of the NNLM website and find our evaluation pathways, a webinar series page. Um, we have recordings and copies of the slides of all previous webinars on this page. So if you have any questions about topics that were previously covered, I recommend you visit this page. All right, I just want to do a quick check-in to make sure that I sound is doing okay. If you could put in yes. the chat. Okay, great, good. You're so good. 
Perfect. Awesome. So um, I know we probably have a wide variety of experience in evaluation here. So I invite all of our attendees today to put their experience in the chat, um, whether that's you use evaluation in your everyday work, or you have worked on evaluation once or twice, or maybe you haven't used evaluation at all. I'll give you a second to think through that and put your evaluation experience in the chat. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, evaluation every day. That's great. Michelle said definitely have some experience also. Fantastic. Evaluate every day in classes and talks and some experience. Fantastic. It looks like we have a wide, uh, a good range of um, evaluation. No experience, use often, could use some tips, some experience with class level uh, evals. Great. Awesome. It sounds like we have a lot of different experience levels here, which is fantastic. Um, so what is evaluation? This can mean a different, there are different things to different people, but it is essentially a systematic process to judge quality, combining evidence and values. In the, the type of evaluation we are discussing today, we are using a systematic process to judge the qualities of programs funded by NNLM grants. However, many of these evaluation steps and techniques we cover are still applicable to evaluating programs, even if they aren't funded by NNLM grants. I like to think of evaluation like a train station. We take in information and data, evaluation happens at the station, and then out come the results. So information and data that we could take in um, include many different sources that could come from surveys, interviews, program documents, budgets and expense reports, monitoring, monitoring data, or data that's been previously collected by other organizations. The results can also take many forms, but typically we see some type of report and including data visualizations like graphs, Briefs are also produced, as well as presentations, and many decisions come out of the evaluation results. Everyone builds their evaluation station. A, it looks like we have a question. Um, can you please send the closed captioning link? So would you? We'll do. Yep, I'll put that in. Awesome. Thank you. Um, everyone builds their station a little bit differently. Um, depending on the needs of an evaluation, we might use one technique or another. We might use bricks or you might use wood to build our station. It just depends on the needs of our evaluation. So what we'll cover here today are some of many of those different techniques one can use to evaluate a program. And the techniques used can depend on a lot of different factors, including the length of the program, the number of program participants, the funding, any resources that are available, and if we want results to be generalizable to the population or just specific to the program. Based on some feedback that we received in our previous webinars, we're also creating a toolkit of recommended evaluation practices for small size NNLM grants for between about five and $10,000 for those grants. So that information will be up on the website soon. So now you might be asking what happens at the station. In our review of the existing resources, we found NL NNLM's four steps to evaluation. We wanted to build the pathways along these four steps to ensure that we were building on the strong foundation that has already been set by NNLM and NEO. However, the four steps presented on the NEO website ended at the evaluation plan, but didn't necessarily discuss what happens after an evaluation plan is created. So we added a fifth step based on our conversations with the National Evaluation Office. So our steps are listed here as step one, do a community assessment. Step two, make a logic model. Step three, develop indicators for your logic model. And step four, create an evaluation plan, plus our extra step, step five, 
collect data, analyze, and act. You'll also see that we have the different topics that run along each of these five steps. We take the, these five steps and then um, present them from the lens of the different topics. The context of the evaluation uh, can really change the needs of the evaluation, so that's why we wanted to break down the topics into these more specific population pathways. Why should we evaluate? Well, we know that NNLM requires an evaluation plan in their grant proposals, but evaluation has a lot of other wonderful benefits. For example, data gathered through an evaluation can ensure that we're creating the best possible programs. We can learn from our mistakes, we can identify ways to improve, and we can inform changes and modifications of the program, as well as monitor progress towards goals. Evaluation really allows us to reflect on the success of a program as defined by short-term, intermediate, and long-term outcomes. So now that we have a little bit of a background on evaluation and we all are building the same foundation to work on, let's talk specifically about the rural, rural health pathway. If you have questions, thoughts, corrections, feedback, anything, I invite you to put them in the chat. My colleague Billy is here and she will monitor the chat and then we can also approach any questions at the end of this webinar. The Rural Health Pathway can be found on the NEO website, which you can find through the NNLM homepage under the National Evaluation Office website page. The pathway itself can be found in the Evaluation Design drop-down menu that's seen on the far right of the upper bar. You'll see when you click on the Evaluation Design drop-down menu, there's Overview, K-12 Health Pathway, LGBTQIA plus pathway, race and ethnicity pathway, and rural health pathway. So if we were, say, an NNLM member organization that wanted to learn more about general evaluation advice, we would click on the overview tab to learn more about the basics. However, if I was an NNLM grant a grantee that wanted to learn more about evaluation from the lens of one of the specific subtopics, I could first review the overview tab or I could jump into one of the specific subtopics. So today we'll be jumping into the rural health pathway. We went over these before, but the five steps to evaluation are to do a community assessment, to make a logic model, to develop indicators for your logic model, to create an evaluation plan, and then to collect data, analyze, and act. All of these steps are mirrored on each subtopic pathway at the top of the web page. You'll see I have a screenshot of that here on this slide as well. In addition to the five steps, we have two other tabs, rural health pathway and example evaluation plan. The rural health pathway has special considerations that apply to uh, evaluations of rural health programs, and the example evaluation plan puts all of the steps together by providing an example of different components of an evaluation plan for a fictional program. So, we'll move through the rest of the webinar by going through these tabs um, one by one. So first we'll talk about the special considerations. The first special consideration that one may want to think about in evaluating programs for rural in rural health settings is to evaluate access to healthcare. We want to evaluate what level of access participants have to health services and information. The low density of populations in rural areas combined with the long distances to reach health services and providers means that residents in rural areas are more predisposed to have issues with access compared to their urban counterparts. Because of this, when you're developing a sampling strategy, which we'll talk about what a sampling strategy is later on in the webinar, and also um, we've discussed during our overview webinar as well, 
um, when you're developing a sampling strategy, remember that issues to access may result in sampling some participant groups more than others because some participant groups might be more easily reachable. Additionally, you'll want to review multiple dimensions of access. Access includes not just whether a service or information is available, but also the ability of someone to utilize that service or information. Things like finances and health insurance status, as well as transportation, broadband and internet access, and language can all play a part in access. On the website, we've included this table of barriers to access to help think through the different access issues that a rural community might have. We talked about structural, financial, and personal and cultural barriers to access, along with some definitions and examples. I won't go through the details right now, but it is available on the website. And this is a perfect time to highlight that throughout the uh, pathways, we've included tables and visuals to help engage the users and make the information more um, exciting and understandable. The second consideration we'll want to think about is the social determinants of health and health disparities. Social determinants of health are broad social, economic, and institutional circumstances that can influence health throughout the life course. And so when we're evaluating a rural health program, we want to gather information on social determinants of health. In fact, the National Advisory Committee on Rural Health and Human Services advises that in order to improve health and quality of life in rural areas, the policymakers and program, develop, or program planners should consider the social determinants of health, including geography, wealth, income and poverty, education and labor markets, and transportation. We want to consider how health disparities may, which are differences in health, um, may change who and how participants engage in a program. Health disparities are very evident in rural populations because of the complex systemic issues relating to the social determinants of health. For example, from 1999 to 2014, the rates of death of all five leading causes of death in the United States are higher in rural, rural areas than in urban areas. When we're thinking through the social determinants of health and health disparities, we want to make sure to analyze health disparities and social determinants of health separately for separate geographic locations. The, uh, we need to remember that social determinants of health and health disparities are different in different geographic areas. Some areas, such as Appalachia or uh, native communities, have larger health disparities than other areas, and we want to be sure to understand that. Lastly, when we're thinking through social determinants of health and health disparities, we want to present health disparities from an equity lens. Health disparities are the result of a complex systemic and structural inequalities rather than anything that's inherent to one group of individuals or another. When we're examining and communicating health disparities through a lens of equity, we should recognize these large systemic issues leading to the disparities, including the social determinants of health. On the website, this is another example of one of the graphics that we've included to make the information more engaging. We can see the rural social determinants of health here all um, pointing towards the social determinants of health. So we have race and ethnicity, community infrastructure, housing, transportation, environment, food, education, and income, which can all play a role in health outcomes seen in rural settings. The last consideration I want to discuss today is health literacy. Throughout this pathway, we've also included several references to health literacy and health information programs because we understand that this is the most common type of program that we would see in this setting. We want to consider how health literacy levels can change your program. A higher proportion of residents in rural areas have lower health literacy compared to urban areas, which can be explained by different structural and systemic differences between rural and urban populations like we discussed with the social determinants of health. 
Um, we want to measure health literacy at the start of the program because health literacy has been shown to change the success of programs and can affect program outcomes. So now that we've covered general considerations, we'll move into step one, do a community assessment. A community assessment is a study of a community. It helps to determine what the health information needs of the community, the resources that would support the project, and information to guide you in your choice and design of outreach strategies. We broke this down into three steps. Get organized, gather information, and assemble, interpret, and act on your findings. Ultimately, this step is about learning about the community, key stakeholders, and their needs. In the Rural Health Pathway, we discuss, as part of the Get Organized step, participatory evaluation methods. Participatory evaluation methods shift the typical the dynamics of evaluations and allows program participants to play an active role in every step of the evaluation process, including decision making. We go through this in more detail on the website. We also discuss stakeholder analysis and we want you to consider identifying early adopters among rural health stakeholders. One way of doing this is using the positive deviance method. This process is time and labor intensive, so it may not be feasible within the time constraints of a typical NNLM funded project, but we do include the steps to do that on the website. Also as part of the Get Organized step, we discuss a SWOT analysis. This is uh, where an organization or program can detail their strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, and threats so that they can better understand how their project or program will work in the community that they are interested in. Also, on this, uh, at this step, we link to a real life, or well, a fictional, I guess, example <laughs> of a SWOT analysis on the example evaluation plan page. The next of the three steps in a community assessment is to gather information. During this phase, um, it's important to gather information from different external and internal sources to inform the development of your program and evaluation plan. We discuss asset-based community development mapping. Asset-based com community development mapping is based on asset-based community development methods, which holds three fundamental truths, that everyone has gifts, everyone cares about something, and that their passion is their motivation to act, and that everyone has something to contribute. This is a part the mapping techniques are participatory approaches used to help identify individuals and community gifts and assets. It can also help to stimulate discussion and planning, as well as connect individual community members together. On the website, we include a link to the Asset-Based Community Development Institute for more resources and guidance. Additionally, we include this chart here, which lists different types of asset-based mapping including individual asset inventories, association mapping, institutional mapping, physical space mapping, and neighborhood economy mapping. Each of these different types of mapping has, are able to identify different things and could be useful for a program depending on the program type. The next part of our gather information phase, we discuss existing data sources, which can be useful for the needs assessment or program design phase. Although these existing data sources can't be used to report against program outcomes because usually they cover a larger geographic area or can't be disaggregated on the level needed for a program, it is helpful to better understand the needs of communities. For example, Say for a rural health program, we wanted to learn what percentage of households have a computer at home in Baca County, Colorado. We can use the U.S. Census Quick Facts page, which is linked from the existing data sources, put in our geographic area of interest, which is Baca County, Colorado, and then choose our visualization type. We would then get a list of different indicators and, and information about Baca County. 
and we can see that the 82.6 percent of households in Baca County have a computer between 2015 and 2019 and 71.2 percent of households have a broadband internet subscription between 2015 and 2019. This could really help us if we were looking for internet connectivity and we would see that a large part of the population would have to find internet outside of their house or mobile phones and those are the individuals may go to the library to seek that connection. The final step of our community assessment is to assemble, interpret, and act. This phase includes uh, processing the information gathered into understandable takeaways that can be used for the program and the evaluation. We included Deanna White's framework for rural health population programming, planning, and delivery, where she identifies six key areas that help improve the effectiveness of rural health programs. The community assessment can help to inform these different dimensions of the framework, which we have included here. They include identifying a rural community, identifying the social determinants of health, focusing on a core rural health issue, integrating multiple levels of community supports, identifying community rural health challenges and assets, and addressing rural health challenges and maximize assets using good practices for rural program planning and delivery. After we've done the community assessment, we move to step two, make a logic model. A logic model is a detailed diagram that shows how change occurs across a program or a project. It's particularly helpful for a program when planning a program, implementing a pro program, monitoring the progress of a program, and evaluating the success of a program. We broke this into two different sections, asking stakeholders and community members to reviewing the logic model and consider how the changes occur across the logic model. During the process of developing a logic model, we also include the tierless logic model uh, process. This is a series of questions that assist non-evaluators to complete the different components of a logic model in an understandable, digestible way. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of fear around creating logic models because sometimes they can be quite complex, but the tierless logic model takes away a lot of that fear by walking through concrete steps to achieve the final goal. When considering the logic model, we encourage people to work through the knowledge, attitude, and behavior continuum. This starts first with knowledge acquisition. Um, and this seeks to answer the question, what is the program trying to teach or show program participants? So we also hope to understand what understanding would a program participant gain over the course of a program and oftentimes, knowledge acquisition occurs as a short-term outcome of the program and can be found in the outcome level of the logic model. In rural health settings, it's important to consider how individuals will gain knowledge as the distances from residences, health literacy levels, and social determinants of health can often hinder knowledge acquisition. It's also important to understand the starting level of health literacy as this can affect more downstream outcomes of attitude change and behavior change. Next, we have behavior change. Typically, we think of behavior change as coming after attitude change. In behavior change, we're seeking to answer the question of are the actions of the program participants different than what we would have expected without the program? Health information outreach programs will likely focus on changing information seeking practices rather than direct health practices. Um, this is also because oftentimes MNLM grant programs don't run on a sufficient timeline to capture longer term uh, health practice changes. In rural health settings, behavior change information may be captured in reports from health facilities or may already be collected by government or non-government agencies, so it's important to examine other sources of data when we're working through the process. Oh, I think I must have skipped this. <laughs> I think I must have skipped this slide. 
I skipped um, the attitude slide. So after knowledge acquisition comes attitude change. Um, and this happens before behavior change. Um, and that's what mindset or beliefs are the program seeking to build or change. We want to be sure to consider cultural differences and attitudes in the community that one is working with. Um, we want to find out if there are misconceptions about the topic or health uh, information, and does this belief change after the program has been implemented? We also want to understand to what extent pro participants agree or disagree with statements related to the program. After attitude change, then comes behavior change, which we just talked through. After we've put together our logic model, the next step is to develop indicators for the logic model. An indicator is a marker of accomplishment or pro and or progress, and is a way of measuring changes made by a program. To understand the way, the way change is happening across a logic model from in inputs to impact. So how do you develop these indicators? You want to involve your program stakeholders in indicator development, review the logic model as a template, and then we also want to ensure that indicators are specific, observable, observable and measurable. We want to include baseline data for inputs and outcomes if we're trying to measure change across time, which we discuss a little bit more in step four of evaluation design. And then, in, or the last step of developing indicators for your logic model, we want to determine whether the indicators are useful and if they are feasible in terms of data availability and timely collected data. So in each pathway, we include examples of indicators that are relevant to the specific topic. On the rural health pathway, we included Healthy People 2020 leading health indicators. Just as a note, in the time between when the pathways were developed and now, Healthy People has 2030 has come out with a new set of leading health indicators. So although these are not up on the website at the moment, they are currently being um, adapted and changed to include the 20, Healthy People 2030 leading health indicators. The leading health indicators are a small subset of 23 high priority indicators that um, that are important to address as they impact major causes of death and disease in the United States. They can help programs focus their efforts and use their resources in a more efficient way. Additionally, since a lot of programs are focused on uh, disseminating health information, we included social and behavior change communication example indicators as well. Social and behavioral Communication change is the strategic use of communication approaches to promote changes in knowledge, attitudes, norms, beliefs, and behaviors. So we thought these were particularly relevant. Some of these indicators include the number of individuals reached by messages, the percent of audience who perceive risk or benefits, and also the percent of an audience who uses a service or product. We also discussed demographic data and the need to de collect demographic data. During analysis, we encourage evaluators to compare differences in backgrounds against outcomes and results to gain a full picture of understanding of what's happening. Oftentimes, indicators will change depending on how they are disaggregated or broken apart into these different demographic sections. For example, we can look at the city health dashboard for the percent of people who are uninsured in Seattle. Although this is an urban location, it illustrates the importance of collecting demographic data. Here we can see that the un percent of uninsured people in Seattle is around 5.2%. However, if we examine it by race or ethnicity in Seattle, we see a very different picture. We see that white individuals have a lower uninsured rate than the overall city rate, while Asian individuals have about the same rate as the overall city rate, while Black and Hispanic individuals have a higher rate. Additionally, we can see in the other category, which I recommend further breaking down into the races or ethnicities that it represents, is even higher and is the highest out of any of these different groups. We can further see differences by uninsured percentage by, in, by gender, where females and males have different uninsured rates. 
and also by age group. All right, so we're moving at a good um, pace. So I just want to take a quick second and check to see if there are any questions. Uh, feel free, again, to put those in the chat. So next comes step four, create an evaluation plan. So I have a question to go back to age group. Absolutely. So in, for this example, there are many different ways we can break out age group, and we can do it either from um, a continuous measure from zero to the maximum age that we're interested in, or we can break it down into age group like this. And so uninsured rate in Seattle, we can see that the lowest percent of people who are uninsured in Seattle are actually in are actually children. The uninsured rate is only 1.6%. We can see that at the same time, the second lowest is in this group, 45 to 64 years, with a percent 4.7%. Uh, we can see that those two are both lower than the overall city rate of 5.2%. But we can also see that the three middle age groups, groups all have rates of uninsured or uninsured rates that are higher than the city average. Does that, so does that answer your question? <laughs> the colored section is uninsured is insured average. Yes, that's correct. And then we break it down by age group. All right, so step four, we have create an evaluation plan. An evaluation plan describes how the project will be evaluated. It articulates the purpose of the evaluation, evaluation questions, a timetable, data collection tools, an analysis framework, and often includes a section articulating how data will be used and disseminated. We broke this down into three subsections, defining evaluation questions, developing the evaluation design, and conducting ethical review. All right, when we're defining evaluation questions, we can typically break evaluation questions into two broad categories, process questions or outcome questions. Process questions seek to answer the uh, question of did we do what we said we were going to do? For example, if our goal was to set up four information corners, were they all set up as planned? Did they occur on time and on budget? It also seeks to inform who, what, when, and how many related to program inputs, activities, and outputs. For example, what percentage of visitors to the library interact with the information corners? Outcome questions are seeking to answer two questions. Are we achieving the why of what we expected to do? And are we then, did we achieve the changes or impact we wanted to see? For example, we could have, by the end of the program, did the program change the level of health literacy among library patrons? Or by the end of the program, did program participants' knowledge of health topics change? On the website, we go into more detail on evaluation design. I won't go into too much detail here, but we talk through these different design options that we see here. The green diamonds represent the program, and the blue text and underline represents a point where data collection happens. So the evaluation design will inform the validity of our results and also will help inform, answer our questions. So we want to make sure that the design allows for us to meet our goals. On the website, we talk about post-test only, where testing occurs after the program, retrospective pre- and post-test, where after a program is completed, we do a retrospect retrospective pre-test, as well as a post-test, and pre- and post-test, where we take a test before the uh, data collection, before the program, and after the program, and then compare the results. We also talk about these other types of pre- and post-test with comparison group, where we have another group that just does not, that, that we test but does not receive the program. 
pre and post test with follow up where we check to see how long results have lasted, and intermediate testing and post test to track changes over time. This is a perfect time to highlight another feature of the pathways. Throughout the pathways, you'll see blue text underlined with a PDF icon next to it. Where you see that, we've included PDFs to help explain more complex topics in more detail. So, for example, evaluation design is a very complex topic, and we wanted to provide more of the background to help break it down in easier to understand information. When you click on the link and open the PDF, you'll see that we've created a series of evaluation planning briefs, and this one is on evaluation design. We include more information on the different evaluation designs. I won't go through the details here also, just for the sake of time, but it is on the website under step four if needed. As part of our rural health pathway, we also talk through indigenous evaluation. Indigenous evaluation is useful when you are evaluating a program working with indigenous or Native American groups. Indigenous evaluation is rooted in indigenous ways of knowing inter and interacting with others and utilizes indigenous frameworks and cultural paradigms. We include links to other helpful resources on the website that further explain the different steps one can take in, an, in indigenous evaluation. Just as a note, though, that different tribal communities have different cultures, so an approach that matches one context may not work in another. So the community assessment can be helpful in determining if the approach meets the needs of the tribal community one is working with. For the ethical review section, we review ethical review for rural health programs through the lens of the Belmont Report. The Belmont Report lays out three ethical principles that rec and it recommends programs and research follow these ethical principles. They are respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. If we are considering respect for persons from a rural health standpoint, we want to consider if a health condition would change a participant's ability to participate or opt out of the evaluation. Also, we want to consider the primary language of program participant and how this can change whether or not they understand what is required of them for an evaluation. Translated versions of inf informed consent and data collection tools may be necessary in order for an evaluation to be conducted ethically. From the perspective of beneficence in our rural health program, if an individual has limited access to resources, it can affect how and if a participant engages with the benefits of the evaluation and program. If an individual has limited resources, you can increase the benefits they receive through things like monetary compensation or gifts. In the process of completing the evaluation, consider if you are asking your participants to do things or use resources that they may not have easy access to, in which case that would minimize the beneficence of the evaluation or the program. Lastly, when we're thinking through justice in rural settings, we want to consider that it might be harder for some groups to receive benefits than others. For example, they could be farther away from a town center or they could have uh, other health disparities that may make it more difficult for them to access the program or evaluation. You want to consider how your evaluation could exacerbate or improve the distribution of benefits across people. Factors that could change the distribution of benefits in rural health settings include the participant's distance to the evaluation site, primary language, computer access, computer and health literacy skills, race and ethnicity, and income level. Ethical review is not just about these three principles. We also discuss ethical reviews from a trauma-informed evaluation perspective. If it's absolutely necessary for an evaluation to ask questions about potentially traumatic events, we suggest incorporating a trauma-informed approach. And I, um, we include more details on the trauma-informed approach on the website, including the steps necessary to do that. We also discuss institutional review boards. Institutional review boards, or IRBs as they're commonly known, are administrative bodies established to protect the rights and welfare of human research subjects recruited to participate in research activities. 
Oftentimes, evaluation is excluded from the Institutional Review Board, but the only body that is able to make that determination is the Institutional Review Board itself. We suggest that all evaluations contact local IRBs, and we include information to IRB, local IRBs on the website. We've made it to step five, the final step, collecting data, analyzing, and acting. This is the time to reflect upon what you have learned, gather insights, and inform programming improvements. The, you will collect data according to your evaluation design and evaluation plan that you developed up until this point. And you will, before, during, and after your program has been completed, consider this. You will also complete analysis of the data that's been collected. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, you will act on your results by sharing evaluation results with stakeholders, adapting future iterations of the program, and uh, also identifying needs to be filled. So in a rural health setting, when one collects data, we want to ensure the privacy and confidentiality of all participants. When seeking consent um, from all participant evaluation participants, we want to make sure that the informed consent is translated into languages that are most relevant and is also in language that's easy to understand. We want to consider how we will secure data that's been collected to protect any sensitive information from being released that could potentially harm the program participants. At a minimum, this means data should be stored under password protection. Also on this pathway, we discuss confidentiality certificates. If a program or an evaluation is collecting information on illegal behaviors such as recreational drug use, a confidentiality certificate can be used to help protect sensitive information gathered from participants. We included a link to the NIH page on certificates of confidentiality, which also includes several examples of certificates of confidentiality that people can use, that use in their programs. Next, we talk about sampling strategies. We talk about First, if a sampling strategy is necessary, oftentimes for small programs, the total number of participants is small enough that it's likely more work to actually create a representative sample than it is to just gather data from everyone in the program. However, if a program is operating across an entire region or if we want to make results more generalizable to the population, we want to consider taking a sample. After we have determined that a sample is necessary, we also want to determine if a probability or statistical sample is necessary. In order to do this, there are several requirements, so it might be easier for smaller granted, smaller grants, uh, projects funded by smaller grants to create non-probability samples, of which would provide enough information and are less cumbersome for the evaluation. We include on the website a table of different sampling strategies, non-probability and probability sampling strategies, along with more information on how to complete those. Then we collect data. We discuss on the website whether we want to collect quantitative data, which is data stored in a number format, or qualitative data, which is data stored in, in non-number formats, and how those are appropriate for reporting on program outcomes. We include this chart of different data collection methods, including questionnaires, knowledge assessments, focus groups, observations, and interviews. Each of these link to a CDC brief PDF that includes information on how to complete those different data collection methods. We talk about analyzing data, whether that be quantitative or qualitative data, and the different ways and visualizations we can present that, through which we can present that. Um, quantitative data is often presented as graphs, tables, and charts, while qualitative data is often shown as in text or narrative forms. Qualitative data usually answers the why or how of evaluation questions, while quantitative data answers the what or, and how many. 
On uh, finally for our act, the last step of our step five act, we talked about data visualization and communication. During this process, you want to identify audiences for your, your evaluation findings, and then also for each audience, determine what they want or need to know. We want to consider the best ways to engage the audience and stakeholder groups, and then create an effective data visualizations for that group. We include several tips for making data visualizations engaging and easy to understand, including you choosing the right type or graph of the chart, simplifying results so just a key message is communicated, using color, sizes, and shapes, and also titling the visualization to clearly communicate the purpose and the findings. All right, so I'll briefly jump into a example here. Let me share my screen. All right. I'll give a few seconds here so everyone's screen can update. So what we see when we go to the National Evaluation Office webpage is this main page. Under the Evaluation Design dropdown, we see the different options like we talked through. Overview, K-12 health, LGBTQIA plus health, race and ethnicity, and rural health. When we click on the rural health pathway, we go, jump to the rural health pathway and see that we have the steps at the top as well as the rural health pathway page and the example evaluation page. Each tab contains the information that we just talked through, but to exemplify some of the things that we talked about, we can see that in step one, we have the, the different phases, the get organized, gather information, assemble, interpret, and act, as well as different um, sections related to that. Also, we can see when we have something that is particularly relevant, such as a SWOT analysis, there is a link to the example rural health SWOT analysis or the relevant information that's being talked about. This information can be found in the example evaluation plan tab, which is the only thing we haven't talked through yet. In the example evaluation plan tab, we see a fictional program that we designed and also include different uh, clear examples of evaluation uh, plans, including, for example, the SWOT analysis, the logic model, measurable indicators, and questions. All right, so I know that was a lot of information. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. And um, I'd like to open this up for questions. If anyone has any specific questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Carol notes that this is one of the few evaluations I see the Belmont report other than clinical trials. This is true, yeah, it is more often, it is used in clinical trials, but we thought this was um, a useful way to think through ethical principles in a way that's very defined. But, so yeah, thank you, Carol, for pointing that out. I really appreciate you saying that. And Rebecca also points out that to claim MLA CE credit for today's section, this session, the first step is to complete the evaluation, and she's included the link in the question or in the chat box. Billy, were there any other questions that occurred while you were working through the slides? There weren't. Sounds good. Okay, so I think that is probably the end of today's session. Here we go. You've got some next steps. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, we so all of these recordings are up on the website, like we said before. This one should be up in the next week or so, I would say. Rebecca's been really uh, prompt and great about getting those up right away. Um, and then we will also be releasing the documentation for small grant applications sometime in the future. So feel free to keep an eye out for that. And we hope that these resources are useful for NNLM members and for everyone here. 
So thank you all for attending. We really appreciate your um, presence here today.